Why would anyone want to mock and scoff at the glorious things predicted for our future? The Bible says that one of the signs of the end times will be people who will mock Bible prophecy. So many professing Christians today scoff at the idea of Jesus Christ supernaturally intervening in the affairs of this world. And so scholars today, including many Bible scholars, have come to view the Bible as literature that might have some historical value, but not as the infallible Word of God. Another reason traditional Christians reject the many prophecies about God's soon coming kingdom is because of the many false predictions throughout history. Because of these failures, many people over time have developed a skeptical, cynical attitude toward Bible prophecy. They scoff at the prophecies of God. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Last week we introduced you to best-selling author Jeff Kinley. Jeff has had a successful pastoral ministry. As the author of over 30 books, he's now become a nationally known speaker. Jeff's experience and expertise in explaining God's truth is well known. He's been a featured guest on Fox and Friends, The Glenn Beck Show, The Ben Shapiro Show, and hundreds of national radio and television programs. Jeff's latest book is titled Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. Today's program is again based on that theme. We're excited Jeff has agreed to continue last week's discussion this week. So let's begin. To restart the conversation, here's Jan Markell. Uh, I feel led today to share with you 2 Peter 3, 3 to 5. And the reason I'm doing that is very obvious. Many of you, again, know that the rapture did not occur on September 23rd, 2017. And the media's blowing that, you know, all over the place. You know, calling Christians wackos and, and all sorts of stuff. And saying that, you know, we said the world, or people were saying the world was ending and stuff like that. And there still needs to be a seven-year tribulation period and there's a, a thousand-year millennial kingdom. So I know that the world's not ending. But beside that, scoffing and mocking is at, is in a level I've never seen before. So this scripture has been on my heart lately. Knowing this verse that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So mocking and scoffing, uh, again, is at a level I've never seen it at, especially from Christians. You know, saying saying this stuff. So I wanted to share this with you today because it's been on my heart and it's been on a lot of other people's hearts. Second Peter three three to five. That's you know, so mockers and scoffers out there, you're fulfilling Bible prophecy. This is just another indicator of how close we are to the Lord's return. And welcome to the program. Well, that was just a little tease because uh, we'll talk about that. Actually, my guest from last weekend has come back, and that would be Jeff Kinley. We're carrying his new book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy. There's so much to talk about. I just felt I could not get it all into one program, and he's agreed to come back this week as well. And Jeff, thank you for doing so. Let me just go there for a minute, if you don't mind. That is that little clip I played intentionally, and we're going to get back to what lies ahead, the things to come here. But that little clip is so true. I have never, I've been studying this since the 1970s when everybody was excited. That kind of fell off in the 90s. But the mocking and the scoffing is out of control. I'm sure you see it too. Yeah, I do. And in fact, what's what's interesting is it's not just coming from the world, it's coming from within the church. Absolutely. Well, and that's where we get a, a lot of this pushback on Bible prophecy. And even just talking about uh, the coming of Jesus Christ, I'm like, people, this is in your Bible. It is in God's Word. And yet many people want to ridicule and to scoff and to make fun of and to downplay and even demonize, you know, some of us who are, are talking about prophecy as if we're some sort of opportunist mm -hmm. that are looking for a way to make money or something. No, this is just simply telling people the truth and helping them prepare about what's coming. Well, we talked briefly last week about some of the things that add to this complication, and that would be some of the false teachers, the Herald Campings, the Edgar Wisenhunts, the Date Setters, the Sensationalists. There was going to be an apocalypse in 2012. A lot of people felt the blood moons were significant, and, and they may have been, but the real blood moons take place during uh, the tribulation, the ones that are apocalyptic in nature, the Y2K. So we have some circumstances.
circumstances come along that have fueled this mocking and scoffing is all my point. Absolutely. In fact, I was a, a part of a direct TV documentary called The Sign uh, where I was interviewed about this uh, September 2017 planetary alignment. Mm-hmm. And the director asked me on camera, he says, you know, do you think this is, you know, coming from Revelation 12 in the Bible? I said, absolutely not. You know, Revelation 12 is about Israel, and about Jesus, it has nothing to do with the alignment mm-hmm. of the stars. And yet it caught a lot of people's attention. It did. These sensational events always do, and it gets them thinking. And then in retrospect, it goes back, and it really discredits a lot of things that true Bible teachers are saying because they want to lump us in with some of these uh, doomsday prophets. Right, and it also sort of encourages pastors to stay away from this topic because rightfully so, they don't want to get lumped in with Harold Camping and and the Mayan apocalypse people, etc. Jeff, where we were last week, and let me just kind of reset the stage a little bit. Last week, Jeff joined me for the whole hour because we're carrying his new book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, and among other things, in the book, Jeff talks in detail. We can't go in detail because radio time is way too expensive to go into detail, but we're doing the best we can talking about things to come. And he's got a chapter in there, What Lies Ahead. The order of things to come, I feel, is something that the church needs to consider because, folks, you're going to be a part of the things to come. One way or another, you're going to be a part of the good things. I hope you're not a part of the bad things. And last week, Jeff, we looked at things to come, the rapture of the church. We talked about that. We take a pre-tribulation stand. We talked about the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about the marriage of the Lamb, not marriage supper. That's a little bit later. We talked about the seven-year tribulation. Sent We sent out some warnings about that. No one wants to go through that particular time of trouble. And if you're a born-again, blood-bought person, child of Jesus Christ, you won't because the church has spared that tribulation. We talked about the battle of Gog and Magog, probably early stages of the tribulation. I'm giving this to you folks because you, you might have missed last weekend. We talked about Jesus' second coming. We talked about Israel's judgment, the judgment of the Gentiles. We talked about Satan's binding. And we talked about, of course, his second coming, which of course is huge. So let's pick up after Satan's binding, which is Revelation 20. This is preceded by the judgment of the Gentiles, which is preceded by Israel's judgment. And after that comes the saints' resurrection. Talk to me about that. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, uh, Scripture tells us that those who, those Christians, those believers in Jesus who are beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God will be brought back to life. Those are the ones who did not receive the mark of the beast on their forehead or their hand. It says they come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, Jen, real parenthetically, I want to say that this tells us that it does pay to serve Jesus mm-hmm. even when you die, even when you give your life for him as this missionary recently did. Right. Uh, th- there are so many ways that we can uh, point to the fact that Christ rewards those. If we stand for him, he will stand for us as, as he did for Stephen, the first Christian martyr. But yes, these believers come back to life and they reign with Christ. And then a thousand years later after the millennial kingdom is when the rest of the dead, the evil dead, the wicked dead will be brought uh, to life to be judged. But yes, this resurrection is a resurrection to life and to reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom. Let's move on to the millennium, and we could spend the rest of the hour on the millennium, and it's it's a fascinating time. Prince of Peace residing over literal paradise. Believers will govern over those who have mortal bodies, and sin's curse on creation, thank God, is finally lifted. I mean, even the animals, for that matter, the trees are impacted by the curse of sin. It has nothing to do with global warming or anything like that. It's, it's all the part of sin, and all of that will vanish. Jeff, the millennium is, is kind of a puzzle to me. It's a literal thousand years. Now, there's a huge section of the church that doesn't take that literally. They would be, they would be amillennialists, and what would they believe? That we're in the millennium now, I think. Yeah, they would spiritualize the millennial kingdom. They would say that the, uh, the the thousand is not a literal thousand years. It's just a picture of a, quote, a very long time type thing. One of the biggest problems is that those numbers repeated six times mm-hmm. in seven verses. You know, God's trying to make a point here. He's, he's trying to be clear with us about that. So I, I don't believe that the reign of Christ on the earth is simply a, you know, a spiritual thing that's sort of happening now. And if that's happening now, quite frankly, he's not doing a very good job of it because the planet's in chaos and certainly not in the heart of many of his people. So I think it is a future, literal, physical reign upon the earth that lasts for a thousand years. And you know what? 
The great thing about that, Jan, is that no listener right now on your program could even possibly fathom the amazing, wonderful things that Jesus Christ has planned and in store for those who love him. I mean, this time, as you mentioned, is going to be a time where we're living in paradise. Uh, The Prince of Peace is sitting upon his throne. He is rewarding his faithful. He's giving us governing role over the nations. The lamb and the lion will lie down together. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 11 that even the snakes won't be biting anymore. But really, the greatest part of all is that we get to be with him. We get to worship the lamb. We, as people, will get to fellowship with one another on a level that we couldn't even imagine before. And so, yes, it'll finally be uh, peace on earth because the Prince of Peace is reigning. Well, some of us, those with uh, our immortal bodies, will be ruling, correct? We will have some sort of authoritative rule. Yes, absolutely. And the Bible says even that we'll judge angels. And I imagine many different responsibilities and, and abilities that the Scripture doesn't even mention because God certainly can't include everything in the Bible that's going to take place. So uh, suffice it to say it will be a time of bliss, a time of peace, a time of enjoyment, a time of fulfillment, and a time of great worship. you have any idea what we might do in the millennium? Now, you just said we might worship. Okay, but I doubt if we'd worship uh, probably around the clock. You think we'd have assignments, have some sort of uh, occupation? occupation in the millennium? Well, you, you know, God does give us responsibilities here on earth, so it makes sense that he would give us responsibilities, you know, during the millennial kingdom. I think part of it is, is simply going to be the focus being on Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, right now the church is so distracted on, on so many earthly things, and, you know, as, as Paul, you know, told the, the Colossians to set your mind on things above, we're going to finally be able to set our minds on the things above and the person who is above, which is Christ. But yes, I think God will keep us busy with great enjoyable activity. We certainly won't be plowing a field by the sweat of our brow, yeah. but it's going to be uh, enjoyable responsibilities and fun. I mean, why wouldn't God ha- include fun in this thing as well? As Solomon aptly said in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 2, who can eat, who can drink, who can have enjoyment without him? And so I think it'll be a time of unprecedented spiritual godly pleasure. Well, and government will work too. We've seen in recent decades that government doesn't work very well. In recent years, it doesn't hardly work at all, but it's going to Jerusalem is going to be the center of the world. Uh, Jesus Christ will rule and reign out of Jerusalem, not Washington, not Cairo, not Damascus, but Jerusalem, again, that holy city. Amen. Talking to Jeff Kinley for both last week and this week, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell, because we're carrying his newest book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. And you can find it in my bookstore, olivetreeviews.org. You can call us uh, in Anytime, Central Time. You can find it in your local bookstore as well. Jeff, at the end of this millennium, I'm sorry, I'm I'm not wild about this idea. Kind of referred to it last week briefly, Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. Uh, Satan is released for a final rebellion, and some will have been duped by him during the millennium. Explain that. That's hard to understand. Well, the Scripture tells us in Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10, that that Satan will be released again to deceive the nations Mm -hmm. again. Now, we've got believers uh, coming into the millennial kingdom. The implication is that they will repopulate the earth to to a certain degree, and that that makes up a part of those nations that we see over that thousand-year period. You know, Satan has had a thousand years to sit alone in his dark cell. And, uh, you know, being intrinsically evil, uh, he's had time to reflect and think about how he's lost the power over the earth, over the nations that he once had during the tribulation period and then leading up to that time as well. And so he's going to come out with a seething hatred and a desire for revenge against the Lamb of God and against those who are made in his image. So he's released for a short time. We don't know exactly how long that's going to be, but he's going to amass this huge rebellion of people against the Lamb against Jesus Christ. And uh, the Bible calls these nations Gog and Magog, and obviously that won't mean exactly the the same terms that we saw back in Ezekiel 38. I think it just simply means that it's going to be like that type of rebellion against God and his people, sort of an Armageddon part two uh, kind of thing, if you will. And the Bible tells us that fire comes down from heaven and just consumes them. Now, the question then becomes, why would God even do this? I mean, why doesn't God just simply judge those who are rebelling against him type thing? And, you know, 
the, the short answer to that is we won't, don't really know. However, you know, some have speculated perhaps this is a way to, to just, just to communicate to us now is that Satan never changes. He, he has no redemptive qualities mm-hmm. or, or redemptive possibilities about him. And then also that tells us that, you know, the human nature is, is still depraved. I mean, those who are born during the millennial kingdom, they're not born righteous. They're still born in That's sin right. like the rest of us, and we're still susceptible to temptation. And I think also, you know, for whatever reason, you could ask the same question about why did God allow Adam and Eve to, you know, to take that fruit. But Satan is released, I think, just to show that God does triumph over evil. Even even when you think that uh, you know evil's been taken care of, God still tells us that He's in charge and He will not be overcome by sin and by evil, even by the one who is the most evil one. Then when does the Antichrist, false prophet, and the, and the devil actually get thrown permanently into the lake of fire? Well, it tells us in, in Revelation uh, 19 that, uh, that that happens, that he casts them uh, into uh, the lake of fire. And so that's when they get cast into the lake of fire. And so I think they stay there the whole time. I don't think they're allowed to be released with Satan after that thousand-year period. Again, if you would like more information on Jeff, you can find it at uh, jeffkinley.com, jeffkinley.com. He's author numbers of books, and his ministry equips churches to discern the times. He's got a weekly podcast, uh, Vintage Truth. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com. Actually, I met Jeff for the first time in mid-October as we both were ministering at a prophecy conference in Oklahoma City, and uh, that was an interesting time. Jeff had 30 other speakers, so uh, we had a lot of, a lot of competition that day, that weekend. Yeah, yeah. Very busy time for yeah, all of us. It was. Jeff, let's start talking here for a moment if we need to pick it up in the next segment, we will. But the great white throne judgment, this is so important. It is for the unrepentant people who are going to face God in a future judgment. There's no pardon. There's no reprieve. There's only eternal torment. People being damned for eternity at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. There might be someone listening who could be potentially headed there. Absolutely. And this really is kind of a um, one of these passages you, you sort of take your shoes off and tread lightly on because uh, it's a very sobering part of Scripture and perhaps one of the most frightening passages in all of the Bible because, Janet, it tells us that those unrepentant souls who've been kept in hell since their, their time of death are now brought out of hell to be officially judged at the throne of God. Obviously, this throne implies great authority, and obviously God being the authority of the universe, there's great fear that struck to the heart of these people. But, you know, there's no appeal process before this court. Uh, there's no time for second chances. There are no reprieves. There's no chances to believe in Christ. Uh, they had their chance mm-hmm. during their time on planet Earth. And the Bible tells us that all the fate of all those who reject Jesus offer salvation is a place of great torment where there's no rest, day or night. There's no pardon. There's no chance to, to even catch your breath because they heard God's truth. They chose to reject him. And I think that's the most regrettable thought any human could ever have mm-hmm. is to be in hell and to know that they chose to be there, that they had a chance, but that they chose not to. You know, somebody may say, well, gosh, you sound like you're trying to scare people into heaven. My response to that is, you know what? If you were diagnosed with cancer and I said, if you don't take this treatment, you're going to die, and you took the treatment because you were afraid of dying, I'd say that's still a pretty good motivation. In fact, I came to Christ myself out of a fear of dying and being without God in hell forever. So, yes, I think this should be a passage that people should uh, should know about, should read about, Christians should share with their friends, just as a matter of reality. This is a prophecy that God has given in Scripture that is going to happen. Well, speaking of prophecy, folks, just a heads up here that I will be speaking at a prophecy conference. I'll be joining some of my prophecy leader ministry friends Saturday, January 5th in Southern California. I'll be joining Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, Pastor Barry Stagner at the Awaiting His Return conference at Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. And if you'd like to attend, if you live out that in that region of the country, you need need to register at cctustin.org, cctustin.org, and they will live stream it. I believe they'll DVD it as well, but you need to contact cctustin.org for info, not Olive Tree here. And the event begins at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. It's one day only, Saturday, January 5th. Again, Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, Barry Stagner, and yours truly, cctustin.org for all the information you would need on that activity. Coming up, first week of 2019. I am back in a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Jeff's latest book is titled Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. 
For ordering information, click on olivetreeviews.org. Today's discussion with pastor, author, and speaker Jeff Kinley is the second of a two-part series. If you missed last week's conversation with Jeff, just visit olivetreeviews.org and click on the Radio Archive tab. Remember to save the date. Circle your calendar for the next Understanding the Times conference. Do plan to join us in the Twin Cities on September 21st, 2019. Early next year, we'll begin sharing more details about our next weekend event, so be listening for that. We're so thankful our audience has grown in 2018. More listeners have decided to become partners with us in this listener-supported program through their tax-deductible gifts. To all of you, we just want to say thank you. As 2018 comes to a close, we encourage you to help us end the year in the black by giving to this ministry. We welcome your gifts when you write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give by phone when you dial 763-559-4444. After this brief timeout, Jeff Kinley and Jan Markell will continue. Please stay with us. As our year winds down, we want to thank all of you who have supported this radio outreach in 2018. We now air on over 825 radio stations and around the world electronically. You have made this possible. There is still time for a year-end gift. You can do so online at our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can also call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or just drop us a note with a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We call this program Radio for the Remnant. If you are a remnant believer, we hope you will encourage one another and look up for our redemption draws nigh. If our headlines have you down, remember, everything is falling into place. Teaching Bible prophecy would be one of the greatest things that a church could do to its congregants because, one, it gives them the hope of Christ's soon coming. Secondly, it motivates them to get the job done. That is to get out there and tell their friends and their family and their co-workers that Jesus Christ is coming. And then thirdly, it brings people great, great confidence. Confidence in knowing that God's Word never fails. It will never fail because what God has said in the past has been confirmed by His prophetic fulfillment. Study Bible prophecy and get excited about the future. What you understand about judgment now, once you understand the truth of it, should have an impact on how you live your life now. Because it it will set you free from some of the fears about death and judgment that a lot of people have. God never pours out his wrath without warning. He does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He warns through remedial judgments and through prophetic voices. Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, author Jeff Kinley's newest release, is again the theme of today's Understanding the Times broadcast. Jan's conversation with Jeff began last week. If you missed part one of this two-part series, You can hear it all at olivetreeviews.org under the Radio Archive tab. Now once again with our guest author, Jeff Kinley, here's Jan Markell. Another question I want to throw at you is why is biblical prophecy important? Biblical prophecy is important because basically it makes up 30% of the Bible. And that's huge because if you look at 39 books of the Old Testament, 17 of them are prophetic books. If you look at the Gospels, big portions, look at the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, look at the whole book of Revelation. These are prophetic books. Jesus talked about prophecy. Paul talked a lot about prophecy in his epistles. So one out of every four verses basically is, is prophecy. So prophecy is very important because it's important in the Bible. And not only that, but prophecy reveals the beginning and the end. So if you want to know what happened and what's going to happen, 
You look at the prophetic words of Christ and the apostles and prophets in the Bible. Bible prophecy also introduces us to the divine revelation. It shows us uh, important facts about scripture and things that God is intending to do through the fate of mankind. So biblical prophecy is a big portion of the Bible. Therefore, it should be an important process of learning for Christians in general. And if you decide to give a definition of prophecy. Prophecy, yeah. Prophecy is a study of future things to come. And so in theology, we call the term eschatology, studying end time stuff. But prophecy, and here's an important thing because that's a good, it's a good question because in Revelation 19, we know that prophecy through the Spirit of Christ. So if you want to really understand more of Christ and who He is, we have to study prophecy. And the Bible also says those who study will be blessed. Okay, welcome back. And for two weekends now, we've been looking at a single book. It's Jeff Kinley's book, The Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. And I've had Jeff on the line, and we're doing again this weekend. Because I feel the Content is important. Now, I will admit, I've focused on probably just a few pages of the book because the book is talking about so many things that are important. But what caught my eye was a section of the book titled, What Lies Ahead? And that's what we've spent a couple of weeks looking at is what comes first, followed by what, and what are the characteristics of that particular generation that's going to be experiencing from the rapture to the tribulation of those who are left behind to the millennium. So we have worked our way up, Jeff Kinley. We've worked our way up to, we've gone through the millennium. We've even talked about Satan's release and the final rebellion, Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. God let him out for some reason. You have given a good warning on the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Let me ask you this, Jeff, those who die without Jesus Christ, do they sort of go to a holding tank and then come before that great white throne? Well, the Bible tells us they'll be cast into hell and they'll they'll be suffering under God's wrath. I don't think that you know the Catholic notion of purgatory or, or some sort of uh, waiting room before uh, they experience God's final wrath. No, I think they're going to be uh, experiencing judgment uh, from the day that they die. And Hebrews 9.22 says you know, that once a man dies, he, after that becomes the judgment. So I think they'll be suffering under God's wrath. But if you want to call it a reprieve, you know, of them getting a, a sense of relief is now coming before the white throne to officially be judged from God. That's the only time they're going to be out of hell okay. for that brief time. But I think after that, they're going into the lake of fire. There's no pardon. There's no reprieve. It's too late. It's just no. eternal torment, damned for eternity. And that's for those folks who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeff, let's move on here because there's a very intriguing time And I don't think any of us can possibly understand the mind of God here. Let me just say, and it would be sort of the new heavens and the new earth. It's after the millennium. God will destroy everything in the universe. That's Revelation 21. They will simply no longer exist. He will destroy the heavens and he will destroy the earth. I want to just ask a couple of specific questions because apparently he wants to literally make all things new. Help us understand this. Yeah, well, you know, Second Peter tells us that the earth one day and the heavens will be destroyed with intense heat, unlike, you know, previously God destroyed the world and the people in it with water, but now it's going to come with great heat. And I think one of the reasons that the Lord does this is to help us understand that nothing of sin will remain in God's economy. He's destroying everything remotely related to that that past life and that past relationship with sin. You know, Peter even says that because God's going to do that, I mean, think about this. If you knew you were on a ship that one day was going to sink, you would certainly think about getting off that ship at some point. And so what God does basically is he removes us from that and he creates a new heavens and a new earth uh, for our pleasure and for our enjoyment. In fact, the the Greek word he uses there is the word kainos, which means something that is fresh and unlike anything ever before. It's new in quality. So it's not like God's going to do a fixer-upper version of the old heavens or the old earth, but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And Scripture tells us there's going to be this new Jerusalem, as you mentioned before, this massive cubed-like city. And, you know, I have a hard time wrapping my my mind around that, Jan, just, you know, 1,500 miles in every direction. But the Scripture tells us that there's going to be gold streets there and, and gates of pearl. This is where people get the whole idea of the pearly gate mentality. Unfortunately, Peter won't be there checking IDs right. for people, but there'll be a crystal clear a river of water flowing in this place. And, and the tree of life that, uh, that we lost back in the garden will return again. So, so many things God's going to give to us. 
us, things that our, our eyes haven't seen, our ears haven't heard, perhaps even colors we've never seen and sounds we've never experienced and, and feelings and emotions that could only come with a glorified, redeemed humanity. And so, yes, God will make all things new, and best of all, we'll be with him. And you write this, finally, the deepest longings of the human heart will be fulfilled. So they might not have been fulfilled in the seven years we're in heaven or the thousand years we're in the millennium? Well, because God's going to make something new, I think he's going to just increase that even better. And think about it, with an infinite God, with infinite power, infinite wisdom, and unconditional everlasting love, God is able to say, you know what, you think this heaven is great? Look at what I'm about to do for you. And Jan, what that tells me is that God's love for us is even greater than we have ever even imagined. That once we see him, uh, we're going to realize things about him and know that he truly is a good God. Not the God that Satan caused Eve to doubt in the garden, but a God that can make all things new, uh, even better than the previous heavens, the previous millennial kingdom. Yes, God's going to create a new one. You can learn a lot more in the uh, book that we carry on olivetreeviews.org, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org. Go to our bookstore, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy. You can find it in your local Christian bookstore as well, probably christianbook.com as well. It's authored by Jeff Kinley. You can learn more about Jeff at jeffkinley.com. And we had Jeff on before talking about all related issues to what we're talking about today. But we're not carrying a lot of products these days. But I did happen to spot this one because I appreciate both the author and the publishing house and know that only solid material comes out of them. So we've talked about the topic here for two weekends. Last weekend, we've picked it up again this weekend. And Jeff, you talk about in the book about stage setting signs, and I would like to just reference a few of those, and perhaps we can comment on them a little bit. Actually, I've been writing an article. These, this programming is going to air here as we're kind of winding down 2018. And I wrote an article about some of the top Bible prophecy stories of 2018, and I don't want to go through that. I want to just cite a few and get your perspective. And I think the biggest story of, of 2018 and the topic that we're talking about here anyway would be Israel celebrating her 70th anniversary and then the U.S. Embassy being moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem on her 70th anniversary. And I, this just blew my mind. And Donald Trump actually came through with his promise. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Israel obviously being in the land is, is the super sign, I believe, of the end times. I think it's what really starts the God's prophetic clock uh, moving again. But I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, America has been Israel's staunchest ally uh, really ever since uh, her, her rebirth in 1948. I mean, we haven't always agreed with Israel. We've had some kind of some ups and downs with previous presidents. But I am grateful that, that our, our current president would honor that promise and ally ourselves once again in an even better way with Israel. And it does kind of tell us that, you know, things are happening to really bring the focus back to Israel. And, and I see these things, Jan, sort of like the birth pangs. You know, it doesn't mean the baby's going to be born right now, but it just tells you that, that the earth is really pregnant and uh, we're waiting for these events to happen. And some of these little precursors, mm -hmm. the little tremors that we're feeling leading up to it, I think is another indication of the fact that we truly are living in these end times. I just said minutes ago that, you know, Donald Trump kept his, his election promise. Far more important than that is that God keeps his promises, and he said he'd bring them back. He brought them back a couple of times, actually, and they restored the language. I think it's the miracle story, not of the 20th century, but of all time, is that rebirth of the nation of Israel. But it all goes back to God keeping his promises. He keeps his promise to the Christian as well. He really does, and, and there's only one way really to explain Israel's rebirth, and that is that there is a God, and there is a God who has made promises. He made promises to Abraham back in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and he's going to make good on all those promises, those that have not been fulfilled yet. And, and you know, as you said, Jen, the promises that God has made to us as believers is, you know, I think about this. My wife and I went on, on a cruise, and we were so excited to go there and to see all the destinations, but, you know, leading up to the cruise, I would go on the website, I would look at the ship, I would take tours, I would go 
to the destinations and look there. And I sort of looked with a sense of anticipation, looking forward to what I was going to get to experience. I think every true believer needs to do that with their Bible. I mean, the brochure is good, but the destination mm-hmm. is, is going to be even better. And so Christians need to dive into this Bible prophecy so they can see, hey, this is what's waiting for me. This is what I have to look forward to and what my God has planned for me. And all that really does tell us that, yes, we have a promise-keeping God, and that's something we can really bank on. Well, another story that I watched unfold in 2018 I was intrigued, Jeff, that nationalism was scorned and globalism was celebrated. Now, whether it was the European Union obsession with Brexit in 2018 or the scoffing of the word nationalism, I I was watching globalism once again take center stage. Now, the primary defender of nationalism has been Donald Trump, and he blew the globalist mind back in 2016 when he won. But Europe is the epicenter of the globalist effort, and I think France Francis Emmanuel Macron is the primary spokesman for it. And if the Antichrist comes out of Europe, then that continent, I believe, is preparing the way for him. Would you agree? No, I would absolutely agree to that. And, you know, we've seen it ever since really 1957 with the European Common Market at that time. And, in fact, the the treaty that they signed was called the Treaty of Rome, Mm -hmm. interestingly enough. But, yeah, we we, we see the world sort of converging in on itself. Uh, We're becoming more and more as countries uh, dependent, interdependent upon one another. Nationalism really is being put, you know, to the back seat. It's being given a black eye because, you know, it's trying to relate it to Hitler and that type of nationalism. You can't really be a patriot of your own country anymore. You're really supposed to be a world citizen. All these type of things is really leading the world towards oneness. And I think this kind of background music, if you will, to uh, to this end times play is really setting up the Antichrist step onto that global scene. And I think it'll make it much easier for him in that day to really grab the reins as opposed to try to get all these separate countries. I think they're going to already be sort of primed and teed up to be a one world government. And so, uh, yeah, some of the things that are happening right now, once again, I think are just stage setting realities that will make prophecy take place. Absolutely. And Angela Merkel says, in this day and age, states must be ready to give up sovereignty. Uh, Nationalist countries are not patriotic. Uh, Europe is just begging to enter into some sort of a globalist system. Uh, Don't you think, Jeff Kinley, the one who's holding this back, other than God, is again, America is not cooperating, at least not right now. All of that could change in a future election, 2020, 2024. America may re-elect another globalist. Hillary Clinton is arch-globalist. We've had many. Barack Obama, the king of globalists. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And an election certainly could erode some of the uh, the advances made by the current president. And another thing with that, too, Jan, is the fact that, you know, the, the rapture itself, I think, will be the event that will just sort of yes. catapult the rest of the world into this one world mindset. And the reason for that is because I think America, unlike any other nation, has had, as I mentioned before, not only a great relationship with Israel and supporting Israel throughout her birth and development, but also to the fact that America has done more for the gospel worldwide. And so if even 10% of Americans mm-hmm. are, are believers, I mean, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's 30 million people that are going to vanish uh, from the planet, from every strata of society and government. And that alone will weaken, I believe, America's role on the world scene and enable this one world government to come together much more easily. Another thing, and again, I've been watching sort of the signs of the times, the stage setting, as Jeff would call it in his book, some stage setting activity going on 2018 big time and uh, Jeff would be the probably the foreshadowing of the tribulation birth pangs with some of the natural disasters which were truly apocalyptic throughout 2018 we watched heart-wrenching photos and videos of unprecedented disasters that are foretaste of what will happen in the tribulation the time of Jacob's trouble as a matter of fact what's happened in recent years probably pales in significance to what will happen in the tribulation absolutely and, you know, the Scripture tells us in Romans that the earth is groaning for mm-hmm. redemption. That's right. And I think part of just sin's overall effect on the planet, and, you know, whether you attribute that to, to man's, you know, contribution or not, 
you know, can be debatable, but the fact that the earth is really readying itself to receive wrath and to receive judgment. You know, interesting, too, we mentioned earlier about the, you know, Jesus Christ returning and his foot touching the Mount of Olives, as Zechariah tells us. You know, NBC News reported in 2004 they found a major earthquake fault running through the Mount of Olives. Yes. So even the Mount of Olives itself is preparing for the return of Christ. The whole world is waiting for that. So, yes, these are, these catastrophic, if you want to call them climate changes, that are going to happen during the tribulation will not be caused by man puncturing the ozone layer, but rather by a holy God coming back to deliver his seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. Yes, exactly. Here's where I'd like to go in my closing segment, and it's a kind of a short segment, but I've been intrigued, Jeff, and probably not in a good way, and I'd like to talk a little bit about this because there are some verses in, in Scripture that talk about last day's activity, character, behavior of mankind. The obvious ones are Second Timothy 3, where we see about the decline in the character of man. Romans 1 is another passage where it talks about the depravity of man that's going to hit them in the sort of the last days. And I'd like to unpack that for a few minutes in my closing segment. And we've seen some behavior in the last year that has been just absolutely astounding. And I think it would fall into one of these two categories. Folks, we will do that when I come back. I'm going to encourage you to not go away. And also, I'm going to encourage you to go to my website, Olive treeviews.org and check out the book that we're talking about for two weekends i've talked about it uncovering the secrets of bible prophecy 10 keys for unlocking what scripture really says i've had the author jeff kinley on the line from me all the way from arkansas for two weekends and i've read the book cover to cover and that's why i chose to carry it and there's so much we haven't talked about because you can't do it in the kind of time that i have on air each weekend but we're at least hitting some high points i'll continue Continue to do that when I get back. Don't go away. I'm going to wrap up my two weekends with author Jeff Kinley. In today's world, we just don't hear enough about what God's Word says about the end times. It seems people don't want to know, perhaps because they don't want to believe we are nearing the end. The Bible is clear. As the end approaches, our world will resemble the days of Noah, when people were totally unaware of what was about to happen. We want to keep people informed of what the Bible says will happen. So, we air programs like you're hearing today. If this kind of programming is important to you, will you help us to proclaim our message? With the cost of media going up, we need more weekly listeners to help us maintain this vital outreach on 830 radio stations across America. You can partner with us through our website, olivetreeviews.org, or when you write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, or call us at 763-559-4444. We will rejoin our conversation with author Jeff Kinley in just a moment. First Chronicles 12 says that the sons of Issachar were men who understood the times. That is the challenge to every believer today, to understand our times and to become watchmen on the wall. Thank you for allowing this ministry and this radio outreach to do that for you every day of the year. As the world grows darker, you are going to be called upon to be a light to the world and to delay the decay. Why not mark your calendar right now for Understanding the Times 2019, where you can better learn how to do this. The date is Saturday, September 21st, just outside of Minneapolis, Grace Church, Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Our speakers will include Amir Sarfati, J.D. Farag, Dr. Robert Jeffress, and Jack Hibbs. I will have a message that day as well. Tickets will go on sale next summer. Visit our conference page at olivetreeviews.org for more details. In the meantime, look up for our Redemption Draws Nigh. We report on the news, giving you insights that we are headed toward a one-world government, a world dictator, more Middle East wars, lawlessness, confusion, and political darkness. However, at the end of the day, our ministry reminds everyone that God is in control and Jesus is coming back. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. But I want to tell you something. As God uses men to advance his kingdom through the proclamation of the truth, so the devil uses men to advance his cause against the kingdom of Christ. 
Whenever the kingdom is advancing, it's because the word of God is being proclaimed. You want to advance the kingdom? Proclaim, proclaim, proclaim the truth. Let's return now for the conclusion of Jan's two-part conversation with pastor, author, and speaker Jeff Kinley. Again, Jan Markell. And we have spent a couple of weeks now, I have anyway, with author Jeff Kinley. Learn more at jeffkinley.com. And we carry the book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy. It's going to be carried in my print newsletter, e-newsletter. Sign up online. You can give us a call. And if you do write to us, and particularly if you're sending a year-end gift, would you please tell us what stations you're listening to? That helps us decide if we should stick with a certain station or network and the program is posted to my website every Saturday, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. We are very active on our Facebook page, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries, Twitter, Olive Tree Men. And I think for now, we're going to set aside any more um, announcements like that that do take time. But I want to head into winding up our two-week series on the sort of things to come. That's what we've been talking about. I morphed into a little bit into some of the stage setting signs. Jeff Kinley talks about those in the book as well. Jeff, there's one thing, and I do want to go back to what I teased about, and that is this decline in the character of man. Before I go there, quickly, you give a a, a couple of chapters in this book about the decline in the character of the church and the fact that a lot of of false teaching and unsound doctrine raging through it. What I've seen in the last year, two, three, four years, social justice taking over instead of Bible teaching. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, I have a whole chapter in there called Spotting Counterfeit Truth, Fake News and False Prophets. And, you know, false prophets are not just, they're not just going to suddenly arise out of nowhere uh, during the, the end times, the tribulation time, as Jesus warned, but they're happening right now. Uh, we see people who are bending God's truth, misrepresenting it, mm-hmm. misconstruing it, sometimes redefining the truth altogether to fit a current agenda, a popular agenda. I think one of those agendas is to take the church off course and to focus more on just social justice and, you know, helping people under the guise of what would Jesus do or, you know, what does the Bible say about foreigners and refugees and all those things. And while there may be acts of kindness, we can certainly show people the point of the church is to make disciples. That's the point of the church. And so we have to make sure that whatever we're doing, Jan, is to focus in on the truth of God. So we twist those things sometimes to uh, to sort of fit a, a round peg into a square hole yeah. in the church today. We have to get back to what Jesus taught the early church to do, which was to preach the gospel. And that's how the church began. That's how the church exploded. And if we'd get back to that now, who knows what God would do? It's true. Well, we deal with that on this program quite regularly, uh, Jeff, on some of the things that have going haywire. That's the most frequent email I get is uh, I can't find a church or I've tried everyone in town and they all tell me they're not looking for perfection, but they just can't deal with some of the false doctrines. Certainly not every church. There are some holding to, to truth, but in some towns they can't find a solid church. It's a heartbreaking email that comes in uh, regularly. I want to go to what I teased with in my last segment, and that is I believe that there's an end time character of man that's going to decline, and it talks about that in Second Timothy 3. It's talked about it in Romans 1. And as I've watched some activities this year in 2018, now winding down, we've seen some massive election fraud. We've seen a Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, be falsely accused, all in the name of politics. We've seen witches curse Judge Kavanaugh and President Trump. We've seen a a literal demonic hatred for conservatives during the midterm election. We've seen drag queens appearing more frequently and, and always for children children's events. We've seen members of clergy blessing abortion mills. Now, Jeff, I'm sure some of this, if they'd had abortion mills in the time of Noah, if they'd had drag queens, and maybe they did at the time of Noah, I'm sure they were very popular, but they're coming back. No, absolutely. And I don't know of a passage of Scripture that more precisely and clearly describes our current age and culture than Romans chapter 1. You know, God outlines in that chapter so beautifully about the progression of what happens to a person, to a people group, to a nation, really, that rejects the clear revelation of God that he gives through creation, through our own conscience. And what we see is exactly what's happening in our own country. Because once, the Bible says, once you reject the truth about God, 
God. Then it says God will darken your mm-hmm. mind. He'll That's allow right. your mind and heart to be darkened so that you can't see what the truth is. So the response to that is you have to then make up your own reality. And that's what's happening with a lot of this gender confusion that's going on. People are thinking they're an opposite sex or they're thinking they're, you know, a 50-year-old man thinks he's a 10-year-old girl. I mean, when you take God and God's truth out of the picture, then literally anything is up for grabs. And what's really sad is, is that society is really latching onto this. It's embracing this. And now we're the ones who are being maligned and demonized because we're simply stating the biological or scriptural truth about the matter. And so it just goes down from there with homosexuality and lesbianism and on down to, you know, being haters of God and vendors of evil, lawlessness, anarchy. We're seeing all of that take place right now. And and I fear, Jan, that it's going to get much worse as we ramp up to Revelation's days, because the depravity, the human depravity that we have inside all of us is not getting better. But as Ephesians 4 says, it's continually being corrupted. That's right. So this is going to continue to happen in our world, unfortunately. Well, at the same time, Jeff Kinley, we've seen almost, according to statistics, almost 80% of Americans buy into some kind of mystical New Age belief. So we've got strong delusion, doctrine of demons, not giving heed to sound doctrine. We saw paganism and witchcraft soar this year as well. I mean, it's now fashionable to believe in things that are seriously dangerous. We saw, again, referencing witches cursing uh, Judge Kavanaugh, cursing President Trump, and this this rise of things that are interested in the paranormal, the supernatural. Never a good kind of supernatural. (laughs) The interest is in the bad kind. And, and, you know, just to remind our listeners is that Satan is a highly intelligent supernatural spiritual being and he's not just he's not just randomly throwing darts he's firing missiles and the scripture tells us in Ephesians 6 that he has he has schemes he has designs he has plans he has strategies and all of this we're seeing take place is a part of an overall global strategy for Satan to make people more susceptible to receive ultimately his the man of his choosing the son of perdition the antichrist uh, during the tribulation period right. and in the meantime it's anything to keep you from from Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, whether it be New Age or Wicca or sexual pleasure or whatever it might be, anything to distract you from the truth and the real, you know, redemption that you can find in Jesus, he'll take our eyes off. Again, folks, for two weekends, I've been talking about uh, Jeff's newest book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. It's in my store, olivetreeviews.org. Give us a call, Central Time. It's in my print and e-newsletter. And Jeff, we were talking a little bit off air that one of the reasons you wrote this book was part of it is to use it as a introductory tool perhaps for people just now getting interested in this topic you want to reach as does your publishing house i had dinner with them in uh, october they want to reach a younger generation jeff you and i travel to prophecy conferences uh the average age is over 60 at those events and it would be nice to get some younger folks and frankly i am seeing some younger folks get more interested. How did this come to your mind? Well, for me, you know, I spent 25 years uh, being a pastor to uh, to students, to college students, to millennials, and, and I see the strategic open-door opportunity that we have in that generation to teach them not just about prophecy, but for biblical truth as a whole. And typically, uh, people are simply trying to just keep them interested, keep them coming to church, doing whatever dog and pony show they have to do to get that to happen. My experience has been, Jan, that when you reach them with solid biblical content, the lights come on, and they they suddenly find something to sink their teeth into because they want to know God. And so I wrote this book as a way to help reach even that generation and even someone perhaps who's, you know, maybe a parent or a grandparent to say, take a tool like this, say, hey, this will be a great opportunity for you to learn about what does God say about what's coming, what's going to happen, and wrote it in a language I hope that communicates to them. But I think it's imperative for us to always reach back to the next generation to make sure that we're passing the baton of the truth of God, the faith of God, and the prophecy of God to the next generation. If we fail to do that, then there won't be a next generation of Christians. Well, that's very true. I think that uh, younger people have all sorts of excuses for not going in this direction. I think many of them want to live their full life and, quite frankly, not have it interrupted, say, by a rapture and a tribulation. I kind of understand that, but nonetheless, the glories of the future can't compare to what we have today. Well, 
so true. And every time I've ever taught about these topics to a younger generation, they've been just, you know, wide-eyed sure, and sure. receiving, but, you know, like sponges. And so I really think they're probably more ready to receive it than we are to give it to them. But we have to make sure we give it to them in a language that makes sense to them. Well, there are some speaking that language. And I encourage you folks, you can come out next fall, uh, Saturday, September 21st at my event. Amir Sarfati presents this to young people in a very brilliant way, an Israeli young man who I have featured now for, this will be the fifth year, coming up next fall, September 21st, same location, and tickets will go on sale, not until next summer, folks, so we're not even going to go there with the whole lineup, but just giving you a date for now, because many of you are writing and asking about a date. Jeff, I think we need to emphasize the importance of salvation. We want to keep people away from, well, the great white throne judgment, to be honest, and how do they do that? Well, you know, I would simply say to someone listening right now to this program to to encourage them to look around at the world that that you're living in. You know, this world is not getting better. Uh, There are good things that are happening in the world, but but the world is coming uh, to closing time, as someone has aptly said. And to just simply realize there are two truths you need to know. Number one is the truth about God, that God loves you, but that he's also a holy God, and that he sent his son Jesus Christ to take the penalty, the wrath that you and I deserve, on that cross when Jesus died. And when we simply place faith in him, when we call upon the name of the Lord, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God applies that righteousness to your account. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have your destiny ticket punched, that you'll be going to heaven for sure, and that you will avoid all of the the terrible wrath judgments that await those who reject Christ during the tribulation period. So I strongly urge you to listen to my words right now and to call upon Jesus and be saved, and you'll never regret doing it. Amen. Folks, the future may seem like one big mystery, but it doesn't have to be. God has made his plans evident to all, and when you know what he has revealed, you can face the last days with the confident assurance of his provision and his victory. I want to thank you for listening for two weekends to this topic. We'll talk to you next week. Raining on high, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, highest praises, honor, and glory. Thank you for joining us for Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. We're reaching the world to report current events through the lens of Scripture. This broadcast costs you nothing to listen. It costs us thousands of dollars each weekend. As we produce and distribute this weekly program, would you consider becoming a financial partner with us? In this ever-changing world, Christ followers need to stay informed and to be aware of current events from a biblical perspective. This is where you'll hear compelling programs every week to highlight hidden dangers in our culture and the hope that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us in helping to underwrite this listener-supported broadcast. Please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give at olivetreeviews.org or by phone at 763-559-4444. Around the clock, olivetreeviews.org is also the place to go for daily updates on world events from a biblical worldview. We're looking forward to hearing from you this week. Thank you for your continued prayer support. Join Jan next week when she returns with another information and inspiration-packed hour designed to help you understand the times.